The reason I picked this etching is because the history of reproduction has its own history, and it's a history which is quite separate. Uh, it's dependent essentially on the development and refinement of different processes. Etching was part of the apparatus of the traditional reproductive engraver right through the, from the 17th century to the 18th and the early 19th, although something rather decried by the fine line engravers. And by the stage of the 1860s, however, the author of this etching, Leopold Flamin, you might say the, uh, the etching had really come to it, into its own. He was a pupil of Kalamata. Kalamata never deserted the traditional art of engraving by line. Flamin, he arrived in Paris in the 1850s and uh, he had to make uh, enough to survive and to feed his family, uh, so it was very precarious for a few years. But with the creation of the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, that really made his reputation. Gazette des Beaux-Arts was the trendsetter for history of art and connoisseurship from about 1859 and onwards, uh, launched by the French critic Charles Blanc. And you could also say that um, Charles Blanc really depended on his illustrators. Flamin probably, uh, in fact at the time people said he was the person who made the fortune of the Gazette. In other words, it was his images like this which effectively uh, sold it. I would say that the importance of the Gazette des Beaux-Arts is that not only uh, does it revive interest and stimulate interest in great collections being formed at the time, uh, it actually stimulates the uh, new research into their origins, it gets a lot of things straight that were not straight before, uh, but also that it has an extraordinarily eclectic range of images. And one um, extraordinary thing, Charles Blanc got him to illustrate his classic work on Rembrandt. And what Flamin uh, proved that he could do was not only to reproduce the so-called Rembrandt's Gilda, and he did that because uh, the, the print had reached such astronomical cost at that stage. It was um, uh, something which nobody, no private citizen, could even dream of acquiring, so few were still in private hands. Uh, so that he wanted the print, as he reproduced it, to be available to people uh, on the level of a contemporary etching, and not one that had been done 200 years before. The interesting point about Flamin is that he is equally good at representing the work of Ingres, whereas he also, uh, virtually at the same time, is uh, etching Rembrandt. What is happening is that through reproductive engraving, we're getting simultaneously uh, the finest contemporary works and uh, a whole range of the masters of the past. What is really interesting about uh, reproductive engravings in the context of the National Gallery of Art is that there is a, a large and splendid collection but which is not in the print collections of the gallery but is in the resources of the library. And this is for purely historic reasons. A reproductive engraving from, say, 1750 shows you how people knew a huge proportion of the important paintings that were around. They were in private collections, they couldn't be seen, and therefore the engravings are a, a clue to the period eye. Uh, and the history of reproductive engraving is a way of actually coming to terms with the fact that we don't necessarily, from our point of view, have the only <laughs> viewpoint on the history of art as it's progressed through reproduction. What is happening is that reproduction is providing a kind of level playing field for a full history of art, one which doesn't simply depend on what is fashionable at any one time, but which integrates also the old masters and the masters of the present.